I'm really excited for your class. I don't have a set of all I need I We're going to start off with the gravity recovery and climate experiment team. Okay, I am Connor Owens. I'm from Palmer, Alaska. Hello, I'm Aiden McLaughlin. I'm from Winter Park, Florida. And I'm Serena Rumser, and I'm from Montclair, New Jersey. And I'm Sophia Graziano, and I'm from Galloway, New Jersey. Okay, so what is our project? So basically, we wanted to determine what types of various geophysical phenomena the GRACE satellites can capture. So we did this by comparing model data with uh, data from the GRACE satellites themselves based on the timing of their orbits. So for example, the GRACE satellites could capture a snowstorm in Boston or a monsoon in Bangladesh based on the timing of their orbits. But before we go into the data, what is GRACE? So GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. It is a two satellite system. Uh, one satellite follows the other. Uh, they rotate in a uh, polar orbit, which means that they traverse over the poles uh, perpendicular to the equator. And they are also low Earth orbiters. Uh, they rotate once around the Earth every uh, 94 and a half minutes, and they sit about 220 kilometers apart. And this diagram on the right shows uh, kind of what the satellite looks like in parts and pieces. So this animation here shows uh, how the GRACE satellites work. So as GRACE A, the lead satellite, um, approaches the uh, GRACE triangle, which is uh, represents an area of greater mass and therefore a greater gravitational pull. Um, it gets pulled towards that, uh, let's say it's a mountain, for example, and GRACE B is not yet uh, within the range of the mountain's gravitational pull, so the satellites get farther apart. And the green dotted line in between the two satellites is the K-band microwave system. And this measures the distance between the two satellites. So basically when we say that we are measuring the distance between the two satellites, what we're really measuring is the change in gravity on the Earth, surface of the Earth below. And over time, the GRACE B satellite, the trailing satellite, will get into the range of the mountain. So the satellites will no longer be farther apart than usual. And some applications we can put the GRACE data in to. So for example, we can track climate change with this over time. And we can also, with 15 years of data, we can look for trends to um, predict future climate events. And it also just gives us a greater understanding of our planet as a whole. And since this is the only planet that we live on currently, it's good to understand as much as we can. OK, 
Okay, so now that we understand the uh, what Grace is, it's important to understand its orbit. So Grace travels in a polar orbit, meaning that it goes from pole to pole, like shown in the uh, video there. And so what's highlighted in yellow is the ground that Grace tracks, which are therefore called ground tracks. Um, so we coded a function to plot these ground tracks. And on the left is Grace A ground track data, and on the right is Grace B ground track ground track data plotted in terms of latitude and longitude. And the best way to understand what this data actually means is to envision a map behind it, meaning the zero on the y-axis is the equator and the zero on the, on the x-axis is the prime meridian. And so these graphs are fairly similar, so when you overlay them, they end up meshing together the colors, and that is because they are only a slight distance apart, so they look fairly similar, but when you zoom in, you can tell that they are different. You can see the blue dots distinguished from the red dots. Um, and they're only off by a fraction of the longitude degree because they are 220 kilometers apart. And now that we understand Grace's orbit, I will now describe how our project helped us understand the data of the products. Um, so we defined 24 regions across the globe, and we wanted to find out when um, Grace flies over these regions so that we could play the, so we could plot the Grace data over the model data to see if there were any discrepancies or disparities between the two that Grace didn't track due to the physics of its orbit, such as peaks or troughs that could be caused by um, geophysical phenomena, such as monsoons or snowstorms that could affect the hydrological variability. And in doing this, we wanted to see how well the Grace data fit the model data. And so for the first two steps in defining the regions, we selected our 24 regions and centered them around a three degree latitude by three degree longitude area. Then we checked when Grace flew over these regions and fit within the designated regions and fit by creating and coding our bound check function. First, our function would check if the Grace latitude value fit within the uh, lower and upper bounds, in this case being the top and bottom bounds. And if this was the case, the, um, the function would then go on to the longitude bounds, which are the left and right bounds. And um, if this were then true, the function would return the timestamp that we could use to plot over the model data. Um, when, we were when we were testing cases, we realized that there were some times when we knew for a fact that the point was inside the bounds, but our function would still remain false. So in order to um, fix these, we had to add some lines of code. And one of these edge cases that we had to adjust was um, when the center of the region was too close to the prime meridian that um, the leftmost bound was in fact higher in, lat in longitude degrees than the rightmost bound, which is the case in this here diagram where the leftmost bound is around 358 degrees longitude and the rightmost bound is around two degrees uh, longitude. So in order to uh, fix this, we ended up splitting the region into two different sides. Um, the leftmost being, um, oh, it split down the prime meridian, and the leftmost being um, from the leftmost bound to 360 degrees longitude, and the uh, red shaded, or the right one, being from zero degrees longitude to the rightmost bound. And if it, were, if it was in either of these regions, it would return true, and we would get our timestamp, which would um, give us the timestamps so we could attribute it to the model data so we could further um, graph the data and see if there were any disparities or if it fit well. So we've been talking a lot about this ambiguous model data and so what, it's important to understand what the model data actually is. And so uh, what we did for our project was we used two different forms of this model data. The first one is called GLDOS and GLDOS stands for Global Land Data Assimilation System. So this is actually a model so you can think of it as like a computer program or a math algorithm and not exactly an item or a system on the actual GRACE satellite. And so what this model does is it shows the hydrological variability across the Earth. And so what that means, in other words, is it shows the change in water saturation um, across the globe. And so as you can see in the flowchart behind me, first what the model does is it gathers data from various local databases and satellites, one of which being GRACE itself. Then it pulls it all together and pulls out any extraneous data points so that way you can make sure it's plotting the correct thing. And then after that, it maps out the data in this hydrological variability grid. The other model that we do, or that we use, is the atmospheric and oceanic de-aliasing model. 
And so this, just like GLDOS, is a model, so it's not an actual system on the satellite. And so this differs from the GLDOS model because it does not return a hydrological variability. Instead, it returns two outputs. But as the Grace team, we are really only uh, concerned about the atmospheric variability number. So how this model works is it takes a variety of inputs, uh, runs it through two different methods or math algorithms to uh, provide an accurate output of the atmospheric variability, which you can think of as the pressure across in, the pressure in the atmosphere across the world. All right. So now that we have our model data, which Aiden just talked about, and our ground track plots, which is what Sophia was talking about before, we're able to analyze the data by comparing the two. And so what we see here is not actually one of our plots, but rather a simplified version so that we can explain what's going on. And so say this is a plot for one of the 24 regions we previously mentioned. On the x-axis is time, and in this case we called it months. And on the y-axis is hydrological variability, what the GLDAS model is measuring. The, the, um, I'm sorry, the black stars there are every time that race passes over the region, and these are connected by the blue dashed line. And then the model data is plotted in red in the background. So even though the model data has a bunch of different peaks and valleys, so it's like going up and down, Grace really believes, if you just use the Grace data, that it remains stable because Grace is only passing over that region at certain times. So it's not able to capture these peaks and valleys. And that's what we're looking for in our actual data. So in order to analyze the data, we wrote a little bit of code. Um, this is some of it. <laughs> and basically what this does is it takes the ground tracks that we plotted and then uses our ground check function, which is also what Sophia talked about, in order to determine when Grace enters one of the 24 regions to define. And then once we have those times, it plots out on the grid in a blue X. And at the same time, it's also plotting model data, both for GLDAS and AOD, but in separate graphs. So whatever we show you is going to be either one, but not both at once. So here's our first example. This is from Lake Victoria in Equatorial Africa from 2008. And this is from the GLDAS model. And on the x-axis, we're measuring time in months. And this is from 2008. So if you see 2008-01, that means January of 2008. And this runs through the entire year. On the y-axis, we have hydrological variability. So what GLDOS is measuring in centimeters. And the red line is still the model data. And the blue x's are every time that grace passes over the region. So the, the blue x's model basically every peak and valley of the data which means if you took away the model data, Grace is going to be representing basically the same picture. And so that means that Grace is doing a good job at simulating what's going on throughout the year in Lake Victoria. And so what is going on there? What does this mean? Well, in Africa, especially equatorial Africa, there are two main seasons. So there's the wet season and the dry season. So during what we would know as the winter months, so January, February, March, April, that's when there's a lot of water. It's the wet season. And so that's why the hydrological variability is high. But then as we get into June, July, August, it lowers as it gets dry. And so that's what we see here. Is it going kind of like that? Um, here's another example, in this case from the Gulf of Carpentaria, also from 2008. This is located in Northern Australia, and this is AOD model. So that would be atmospheric variability. Once again, also measured in months of 2008. So while the last example was a pretty good example, this one is all over the place. A lot of the peaks and valleys aren't marked at all by a blue X, which means Grace didn't capture them. And rather than focus on the big picture overall, we decided to focus on perhaps the most extreme version. So you'll see all the way on the left in January, there's a big spike and then a big dip, and Grace didn't capture that. There's no blue X there. And so zooming in on that, we were able to actually see the date of it. And so this dip, this dip occurred from January 5th to January 7th. And we were able, because don't forget, this model data is actually what happened during this year. So we were able to look this up and cross-reference it with local weather sites and whatnot to find out that this was actually a hurricane called Hurricane, or I'm sorry, Cyclone, it's in the Pacific Ocean, Cyclone Helen. And it caused over a million dollars of damages in the death, and this wasn't ever picked up by the Grace satellites. And the reason why it wasn't picked up is because Grace never flew over the region when this was occurring. So 
there's a blue X to the left of it. So race passed over the region just as the hurricane was building up. Or, and then the cyclone happened. And then there's another X once everything calmed down, but it's completely missed by the race data. Here we have another instance where this happened, this time over the Gulf of St. Lawrence, also AOD data, which means that it is once again atmospheric variability. And here, this is perhaps a middle ground between the two. It measures it fairly well, but it still misses a lot of these peaks and valleys. So here are the two that we noticed were kind of the extreme versions once again. Zooming in on the first one, this was actually during St. Patrick's Day, and it was a blizzard. And this one was during Christmas, so we have a lot of holidays going on here. And it's, once again, not really modeled by the greatest data. And these were fairly big weather events that happened. So what can we conclude from this? So in the first graph, you notice that it did fit the data really well. And that's because it was a slow trend as the water moisture kind of, the soil moisture kind of shifted over the course of a year, how much rain there was in the region. It picked that up, it modeled it really well, but Grace wasn't able to fully capture every kind of sudden weather event that occurred in the later two plots because the physics of Grace's orbit kind of makes it so that it can't be over every region at once. And so if you have an event that only takes a few days, there's a high chance that Grace won't be in the region at that time to capture it. Yes, and so based on the physics of Grace's orbit, we saw that the Grace satellites weren't able to capture a few different climate events. So maybe for future work, we could use, we could look into using a constellation of Grace satellites at various different orbit angles, as shown here, uh, to have a better global coverage, and therefore we would be better able to uh, detect the higher frequency signals that we talked about. All right, so we have a bunch of people to thank. So for starters, NASA and the Texas Space Grant Consortium for funding. We'd also like to thank um, UT Austin for housing and um, the space grant. No, not them. We did thank them already. I'm at the Center for Space Research for, um, for um, their facilities. <laughs> And we'd also like to thank the CS faculty for making this entire thing possible. We would like to thank our awesome mentor, Karen Vasallo, for helping us through everything. We would like to thank our uh, teacher externs, Ms. Hanover and Ms. Crenshaw, for being super supportive throughout the whole process. And we would like to thank doc Dr. Urban and Ms. Badiao for organizing this whole event. Okay. And so, what did we learn from CS? Well, personally, one of my favorite parts of the program is just getting to meet all of the other student interns who are here because it's just such a cool experience being able to meet people from all over the country. And we all have different backgrounds, different schools that we go to, and kind of seeing how everyone who's interested in the same topics, but who all have their own perspectives, kind of get together and get to see all of these different ideas is really just an amazing experience. I know I speak for our group especially when I say this, but um, I know that we really learned about uh, concepts as a whole. So for example, we learned how to code, but we didn't just learn what these different functions and different commands meant. We learned about uh, the deeper processes of the computer programming and uh, computer science. And then we also learned about like the application. We didn't learn about the specific instances that it could be used, but we learned about um, all of the earth science that goes behind it and all of the uh, areas that it could be used in. Okay, so a big thing I took away from this was that it really opened like a lot of doors for me and not only in like with like physical opportunities but like in the mental aspect too. It has got me thinking about my future along with the future of our generation and planet as a whole in a way that I never have before. It was also a really great opportunity to be able to immerse myself in um, and ourselves into um, specific topics that typically aren't ta taught in school, such as specific life sciences or um, computer science. So it was really interesting to delve right into it head first and hope for the best. And I think we all um, really learned a lot in these past two weeks and have grown not only as um, um, scholars, but also as people. So. Um, does anybody have any questions? Questions for the 
Grace Teeter. Uh, yeah, Trevor. Uh, what language did you go to? Python. Had you had much experience in coding prior to this? Um, so I can only speak for myself personally, but I um, did not have any prior coding experience. I had dabbled a bit, but I would never say that I could have done any of this. Um, so we did learn a lot. Um, I think Serena has a few things to um, add. Yeah, I think none of us actually had much prior coding experience before this. We learned a lot through the project specific work. Karen kind of mentored us remotely with that. and kind of gave us like specific skills that we would need while using this, but we all really did learn how to code and like especially stuff like debugging, like I got I kinda got into that type of thing. <laughs> I think what was important was the fact that the code wasn't fed to us. Like we were told to think for ourselves and figure out things and it wasn't always just Corinne just just typing everything out. We got to um, figure out the problems and go through line by line and see how we could fix them without the answers being directly given to us. Anybody else have any questions? Hi. Yeah. Uh, grace follow-on is launched now. What's the difference between Grace and Grace follow-on? So it's uh, it's mostly in the systems that are on uh, the new satellite, so they're more accurate, uh, up to like 20 times more accurate than uh, the previous satellites. Yeah. And we talked about the to solve the issue where. Grace missed the cyclone because it didn't cross over what was happening. And you said maybe a myriad of little satellites, if you will. Is there any, do you know if there's any thought for Grace 2 doing that? Um, there has been some research, but there, there's nothing official yet. I'm just saying that I'm off of that. How many satellites do you suggest? Yeah. Um, I mean, in that picture, there were eight satellites. Um, ideally, it's whatever uh, it, it can be funded for. I mean, uh, in this particular configuration, where they're not all in polar orbit, it would have to be less than 20 satellites in order to be effective. Um, so, I mean, that would kind of be the maximum, but satellites are expensive. So. Join me in thanking the great team.
we are waiting for our next group. I should tell you a little bit about the history of the CEAS program. Uh, it was alluded to this morning by Dr. Bedapur, but we actually started as part of a NASA Research Opportunities and in Space Center Science grant that we received here at the Center for Space Research where I had an idea if we could combine several principal investigators, these are the individuals that are responsible for our scientific grants, uh, if we could combine their research, we could get more money than if we just had an individual project. And I thought it might be great if we could invite high school students to come here to work with these principal investigators on their projects. And so that's kind of how the idea for a summer intern program started. And so it was a local program. We actually paid the students. They worked here for six weeks. And it was a Monday through Thursday. They came during the day only. Then they went home in the evenings. It wasn't a residential program. And when NASA's uh, funding decided to go to a more thematic way instead of having education and public outreach in each particular science mission, they decided to combine those things on a more global scale and people could apply for funds from NASA. And if you had a good idea, then NASA would fund it and that's how CES came about. So we wrote a grant uh, three years ago and NASA decided to fund the STEM Enhancement in Earth Science program, which is what you're a part of, and that made it a nationwide program for high school students. We had the first year of our original intern program, we had 13 students that applied for 12 spots. This year, we had 500 students apply for 46 spots. So to tell you that you're the cream of the crop nationwide, you should all pat yourselves on the back. That's a big, huge congratulations to each of you. So we would love to have NASA provide us additional funding so we could bring more students and more scientists and more research and more opportunities. But hopefully this is a way that all of you will keep in contact with each other as well as with your science mentors. But I think it's a great opportunity for us to share the resources. And then this team that you're getting ready to hear, uh, this was our experiment this year. We decided to try a remote scientist, a remote scientist project. So we did not have the scientists here on site working with the students every day. We had a teacher mentor working with them. And then the scientists was at Johnson Space Center and they would Skype in or use a different type of electronic media to work with their students remotely. And I have to tell you, it's been very successful. The scientists are excited and they've already asked to participate again next year. So that is, uh, a great opportunity for us to be able to expand the program with scientists that would work with students remotely on other projects. So we're hoping to get some of those involved at other NASA centers as well. So I think we are just about ready to get started. So I want to introduce you and please welcome the Explore the Moon team. Hello, I'm Jonathan Bell from Harvard, Connecticut. I'm Andrew Tran from Kansas, Georgia. I'm Alex Segan from San Jose, California. And I'm Anami Opal from Orlando, Florida. 
We are here today as the 2018 Seas Explore the Moon team to present to you our final project, Eclipse. So Eclipse stands for Exploration and Colonization for Lunar Independent Presence Study and Establishment. And in a nutshell, this sums up what our project is really about. We're trying to achieve what is currently one of America's most pressing objectives, going back to the moon and establishing a permanent human presence there so that we can study it in greater detail. With this in mind, we had three main goals for our mission. Our first goal was to design a lunar habitat that is capable of existing permanently on the moon. The habitat will house crew members, five crew members, for six months at a time, and will receive resupply missions from Earth every four months. Our secondary goal was to study the lunar surface, as scientists still have many outstanding questions about the moon's formation, history, and composition. Having a permanent outpost there is a unique opportunity to study these questions in greater detail. Our last goal is to develop and study technologies that could be used to expand human human existence further in the space. For example, the moon and the technologies that we develop there as we test our habitat could be used one day to go to the Mars. Each of us had a different role in planning and designing our habitat. I personally was in charge of power and communications, Jonathan was in charge of architecture and the lunar environment, Andrew was in charge of life support and life growth, and one of you was in charge of our science mission and lunar resources. So to get individually, we each had a set of responsibilities that we need to fulfill for that habitat. But the first decision we made was all together, and that was our landing site. We had a, couple, a short list of criteria for choosing our landing site. The first one was that our landing site should definitely be away from the lunar equator, because the closer that you get to it, the longer your lunar nights are. And this hampers both um, energy and just general um, you know, workings of habitat. Our second criteria was for a landing site to contain both Mari and Highlands material. Those are the two main terrains of the moon, and that would just provide scientific variety. Our third criteria was to have a flat landing site so that we wouldn't have to waste fuel um, like Apollo 11 when they had to dodge boulders to find their landing site. Our final criteria for choosing our landing site was for it to be on the near side of the moon, because if our landing site was on the far side of the moon, we'd have trouble getting communications to the Earth. Finally, after much consideration of sites all over the moon, we chose our site to be the Humboldt TN Basin, which is on the upper eastern, eastern limb of the moon. Uh, Humboldt TN Basin is actually a multi-ring impact basin, and outlined in yellow is the outer rim of our basin. The upper edge is not outlined because it's been obscured by later impacts. The lighter material on the moon is called the highlands, and this darker material that's been outlined in blue is the Mari, which is solidified lunar lava. Now I'll hand it over to Jonathan, who will tell you about our habitat. Thank you. Okay, so this is our habitat in the Humboldt Tiana Basin, um, a basic design that will be on CAD. So um, our habitat is 13,000 uh, cubic feet um, in those five sections. So you have the main dome, uh, and you have four modules. The main dome is where the astronauts are going to spend a good amount of their time. It's where they sleep, that's their living quarters, where they have their clothes. Um, it's their kitchen and their dining room where, where they will be interacting with each other. Um, some of the more important things of the main dome are the exercise equipment. Um, as you probably know that um, very low gravity can cause pretty big damage to the human body. So staying uh, fit is very important for keeping your bones and muscles um, in shape. We also have a communications uh, network where you will communicate with or in our four modules, we have the hygiene module, pretty self-explanatory. There's the um, shower, the bathroom, the sink, it's where the, the astronauts keep clean. There's the greenhouse, Andrew will talk about that. Um, there's the geolab and robotics communications module where we will be analyzing lunar samples as well as um, controlling our robots remotely. Finally, we have the garage. The garage is basically the main entrance point for our habitat um, and it keeps everything um, clean and I'll talk about that later. So how it's built, um, you might have seen this um, with the Mars team. Uh, we have a pretty similar um, idea. So we're having an, an inflatable habitat similar to Bigelow Aerospace, which is the um, habitat attached to the International Space Station up on the right. Um, so yeah, you pull out the net, um, the, uh, the uninflated habitat, and you fill it up through shooting uh, liquid oxygen into the habitat. Now, the surface of the moon is much is far too hot for liquid oxygen to stay a liquid. 
So um, it will become a gas. Now, the good thing about that is that liquid uh, gas oxygen, um, excuse me, is actually 858 times the, the volume of liquid oxygen, which means that it will inflate very quickly if you put enough oxygen in it. We want our habitat to have the to have one uh, Earth atmosphere, so I think it's like 14.7 psi. Um, and then after that, once it once it inflates, we'll close the ports and inflate it with equipment and furniture. So it is an inflatable habitat, and there are uh, a lot of dangers in space. One of them, um, very specific to the moon, because of its lack of atmosphere, is micrometeorites. Now, micrometeorites are there's billions of them in the solar system, um, probably trillions, and they're basically uh, dust particles or sand particles that will be flying at cosmic speeds. Now, even though they're really small, they actually can go 25 times the speed of a nine millimeter bullet. So they can cause tremendous damage if precautions are not taken. Fortunately for us, they are. So our micrometeorite shielding fabric actually can destroy the micrometeorites if they were to ever hit um, our habitat. They're pretty infrequent, but it, it could happen. Um, so the actual fabric, the protection air fabric on the outside is a combination of a ceramic um, layering, um, Kevlar, and polyurethane, um, and it's staggered such that it, it breaks up when it, when it gets that um, habitat. Now what's protecting is the, the bladders on the inside. So these are the air pressure bladders, which make sure that the air stays at a consistent uh, pressure and it prevents the air from escaping the mouth, which if it goes into the bathroom of space will dissipate um, and we won't have it anymore. Very bad. <laughs> so, um, micrometeorites are, are a problem, and the fabric that protects them does not protect against radiation. Cosmic radiation is dangerous light particles, such as x rays and gamma rays, that come from the sun and the stars. Um, they can cause damage to, to human bodies. And the way that we protect against that is using regolith. Now, regolith is the top soil of the moon. Basically, it is, um, well, for billions of years, there's been continuous bombardments on the moon. And when these rocks hit the surface, they polarize the surface, um, creating this dust that can be feet or inches thick, depending on where you are. So luckily for us, we have a lot of that where we are, because there are highlands. And we will be filling that into the outer envelope of our habitat. And it's basically like a sleeve over the habitat. And we'll fill it up to six, in six uh, inches. and. This will be enough to stop radiation from coming in to the um, habitat. We'll be filling it up using an Ar Archimedes screw, which is um, a device that will be used to pull up the, um, the soil as seen in the other here. So even though the dust is good for radiation, it is bad if it is um, exposed to humans. So we have dust mitigation techniques. On Apollo, on the Apollo missions, lunar dust caused tremendous health problems to the astronauts. Um, they're so fine, it's so much finer than human hair that it can enter your bloodstream through the air um, and it can cause brain damage. So we don't want that. Um, dust mitigation techniques include having spacesuits always be outside of the habitat. So the spacesuits will actually link up to the wall of the habitat and there will be an exit port on the back where the astronauts will crawl out and they'll be inside of the habitat. So no dust from the space you will get inside. There's also electromagnetic, uh, and electrostatic radiation, which will push away um, any objects that come into the habitat. Um, it will push away the dust and uh, nitrogen black, black uh, gas will blow it off. Now we have Andrew Tran with plant growth and vegetables. So even though we have those goals from architecture, we won't be able to accomplish them unless the astronauts are healthy and safe. And that's where life support and plant growth comes in. In this role, we have the five main goals of maintaining levels of oxygen, water, food, medical needs, and waste prevention. Water in the lunar habitat will be used for, of course, will be used for bathing and drinking, but it will also be used for hydration of food, for oxygen, and for vegetation. We will also use the water for temperature reg regulation where we will need 270 liters of water for just one time and then we won't have to use it again. With, um, with the factors taken from the graph taken into account, um, our total daily water use will be 74 liters and that's excluding the temperature regulation. 
And this equates to 9,442 liters of water for the full four months before the resupply. But this causes an issue of weight um, because it will be too heavy and too expensive to carry up that much water at once, which is why we will be recycling water. Similar to what the ISS is doing right now, we will use the water reclamation system, allowing, which will take in fluids such as in urine, gray water, or sweat. And this will allow us to recycle 84% of the water that we use. With this recycling taken into you, being used, um, we will only need to bring 2,892 liters of water initially. And this in the supply includes a buffer of two weeks worth of water in case recycling just so happens to fail. Our main supply of water will just be from what we bring up from Earth, but satellite data has confirmed the presence of lunar water in the polar ice caps and in the regular soil. And we want to reach this goal of self-sustainment and autonomy, but there are difficulties right now which inhibit us from doing it. And with the mining water ice in regular, it would take too long right now and we will not be able to yield enough um, water from a sample um, given the technologies that we are limited with today. But with technology improving, this might be feasible and more realistic in the future. So the two main food sources that the astronauts will eat are hydroponically grown plants and freeze-dried food. And we can grow vegetables such as lettuce or spinach or tomatoes. And the astronauts will be able to choose from their freeze-dried food anything from meat or fruits. And, hydro and we will use hydroponics because we won't be able to garden like we um, do on Earth. So instead of using normal soil, we will use nutrient-rich water and LED lights in place of the sun. As equally important as food and water would be air, and we will provide oxygen for the astronauts using a process called water electrolysis. And what this does is it sends an electric current through the water, and it will split the water into its component parts of hydrogen and oxygen. And then we will allow it to circulate through the system of the habitat, and it will be stored in tanks like those right above here. Once the astronauts are breathing the air that we provide for them, um, they will release carbon dioxide and other pollutants when they're breathing. And we want we don't want these to pollute the lunar habitat, so they'll be filtered out the air using carbon filtering processes, which uses adhesion to have the carbon act as a substrate in order to catch the pollutants so that they don't spread and um, cause problems in the habitat. Like Jonathan mentioned earlier, the astronauts will need to um, exercise, and in order to prevent significant muscle atrophy, they will need to exercise two and a half, three hours each day so that they can stay in shape. And we will do this using a uh, special um, workout equipment, um, like a treadmill here, uh, a bench, and a stationary bike. And for the treadmill and the bike, they will be restrained down so that due to the difference in gravity on the moon. The lunar temperature can vary by hundreds of degrees Celsius, so we want to make sure it's not too cold or too hot in the lunar habitat. And to make sure we don't get um, exposed to cosmic radiation or the cold vacuum in space, we will use mylar and dacron blankets as an insulator between the walls of the lunar habitat, and that's going to attract heat into the habitat. But we don't want too much heat to stay inside the habitat, so we will have an internal heat regulation system, and that will use cold plates and a heat exchanger, and has like these pipes that cold water runs through, so that heat energy can be sent into space. Any excess you know, heat energy. Our last thing we want to address as life support roles would be um, waste disposal, and we can get rid of urine, as I mentioned earlier, with recycling it for future water use. And for a solid human waste, it will be exposed to the vacuum space where it will be dried out and then packaged so we can dispose of it properly back on Earth. And for garbage, we're gonna put them into special capsules and then send it back to the through the atmosphere of Earth to uninhabited areas so that it can burn on re-entry and not um, affect anyone. Now I'm gonna hand it to Alex to talk about power. Alrighty, so all of the life support systems that Andrew mentioned are obviously really important. 
but we can't have those life support systems without power. Unfortunately, due to the limited resources that are available on the moon, we only have a few options because we're going to have to bring all of our power infrastructure from Earth. So some of the options we took into account were fuel cells, solar panels, and even nuclear fission. The problem with fuel cells, unfortunately, is that they run off of volatile elements such as hydrogen and oxygen, which are in especially low abundances on the moon. So fuel cells aren't really a viable option. Instead, we're going to have to rely on solar, panel, solar panels or nuclear fission. Solar panels by themselves aren't that great of an option either, however. At our landing site, lunar nights can be up to 14 days on it. This means that the solar panels would only be generating energy for half of the time that the astronauts are up there, which could pose a risk if there's any emergencies. Therefore, nuclear fission is our most plausible option, and luckily NASA has already been working on this, and they've developed something known as the Kilopower Project. That is basically what you see up here is the Kilopower unit. It's a miniature fission reactor. At the base is the uranium reactor core, where the reaction is taking place and heat is being produced. Sodium heat pipes wrap around that core and carry the heat energy up to the top where thermal converters produce the electricity. And this has several advantages over solar panels. It's capable of producing 10 kilowatts of energy per day, which means that we only need four units to, add, to meet our 40 kilowatt per day energy requirements for our habitat, which I forgot to mention on the last slide. Um, it also can operate during the night as it doesn't require sunlight. It's pretty fail safe. NASA has run rigorous tests on it and thrown everything up to a complete reactor meltdown at it, and it stayed safe, if not functional. But it should function most of the time. And it will require little maintenance, because in order to protect ourselves from the radiation that the reaction will give off, we need to bury the units in the lunar ring with upon arrival. So once the astronauts start the reaction and bury the unit, they will no longer have to worry about maintaining it. It will continue to produce power for up to 12 years. So the Kill Power Project is still hypothetical. It's been tested rigorously on Earth, but not yet in space. So we need to do that before we can move forward with using it to power lunar habitat. But my team and I have found in our research still more opportunities to improve the Kilowatt project even further, even though it hasn't been tested yet. And one of these options would be using thorium fuel instead of uranium fuel. Thorium has many advantages over uranium. It's in the same group on the periodic table, which means it can also be used in vision. But it is more abundant on both the moon and on Earth, which Anubi will mention later for the moon. I have a map up here that shows a spot of Hyborium pretty near to our landing site. It's also easier to control, as it is not naturally fissile, which means basically that you can stop a reaction whenever you want to. And finally, it produces less harmful byproducts. There is much less of it produced in the end of the thorium reaction than there is in the uranium reaction. And the radioactive isotopes that thorium produces are also much shorter lived than uranium isotopes. An option that's pretty far out there in the future, I should mention about thorium that it's already been tested on Earth, so we know that it works as a reactor fuel. All that's left to do is test it in this Calipop project. But this option is even further out there, and that's helium-3. Helium-3 is a rare isotope of helium that is rare, really rare on Earth, but it's abundant on the moon, and this difference is from one main thing, atmosphere. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, solar radiation can embed charged particles in the surface under the regolith, and most of these particles take the form of helium-3. There's a map up here that shows the relative concentrations of helium-3 around the moon. Helium-3 is so important because it's a potential fuel source for a type of power that we haven't really developed yet, nuclear fusion. I talked about nuclear fission with the Kell Power Project, which is unstable atoms splitting into smaller atoms and producing energy. Fusion is the combination of smaller atoms into a bigger atom, and it produces a lot more energy a lot more efficiently than fission does. It's also a lot cleaner. A helium-3 reaction would produce only some spare protons and normal helium. So we won't have to worry about radioactive byproducts or anything like that. However, as I mentioned, we have not yet developed fusion technology and we haven't yet harvested in a big moon. But if we could ever reach that point, if our technology keeps advancing, we might one day be able to have corporations on the moon that just mine in the industry and they could power our entire planet as well as our tiny lunar colony. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to communication. Obviously, it's important that the astronauts have constant contact with Earth, just in case any emergencies happen. Luckily, NASA already has a system in place that we can use for this, and it's called the Deep Space Network. It has three ground-based stations, one in America, one in Spain, and one in Australia. And each station consists of a series of large antennas, which, like the one you see there, that's from the Goldstone California Array. When used in combination, these arrays of antennas can pick up signals as faint as two billionths the power of a digital watch battery. So these, this system has been used to monitor satellites that have gone even beyond the outer reaches of our solar system. And it would be more than satisfactory for our moon base. Um, 
This station broadcasts and receives signals on three bands, the S band, K alpha band, and X band. These are used for different types of data, but it's a little bit beyond the scope of this project. So in terms of infrastructure for communication on the moon, we won't need much aside from that lunar communications terminal that you see in the right of your screen. The tall antenna would be used for local communication. So if the habitat needs to talk to a spacesuit or a rover needs to talk to the habitat, those signals will be relayed back and forth using that taller antenna. The small dish would be used to communicate with Earth, and the signals that it beams back would be picked up by the deep space network. This could include anything from video to audio files, to results from scientific analysis to I'm now going to hand it over to Anavi to talk about our scientific mission. For our Eclipse mission, we have six main scientific objectives. And they'll all need the use of a remote-controlled rover, which will take samples from the moon and will also make observations. Our first um, scientific objective is to study the magnetic anomaly that's at the center of the Humboldt Tianan Basin. This, this point of unusually high mass is present in other basins across the moon as well, but in only some of them. This unusual anomaly could point to, to could be evidence for the early lunar dynamo, which is the early lunar magnetic field. Our second science ob objective is to study the compton belkovich thorium anomaly, which Alex mentioned earlier. Thorium is useful by itself, but this anomaly is even more interesting for a different reason. This anomaly contains a layer of creep, which is an acronym for uh, potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus. When this layer is at the surface of the moon, it can provide important insight into how minerals in the moon crystallized. Our third scientific objective is to study Hain Crater. Hain is a very young crater just to the north of our basin, and you can still see its rays coming out in the second picture. Those rays in light blue are areas of higher titanium, and there's a strand of especially high titanium right next to our basin that would be very interesting to study. Our, our next objective is to study all of the material from the, man, from the mantle. Now, Humboldt Tian Basin, this is an elevation map up here, um, so low that scientists think that the original impactor could have gone deep into the lunar mantle and excavated all of the it. And this olivine is now at the surface on the rim of the basin. Um, studying this olivine could, again, um, provide insight into how the early moon formed. Our fifth science objective is to study water on the moon. As Andrew mentioned earlier, it's not yet feasible for us to use this water to power our entire habitat, but we should still sample it for use in future missions when our technology does improve. Our fine science object, final science objective is to study the Mare and Highlands in our crater. These Mare and Highlands are from many different geologic periods and contain many different minerals. And these minerals can be separated from each other by using a process called the electrostatic separation of regolith using tribocharging. Basically, this is just a big fancy name for using uh, electrostatic uh, energy to separate these particles in order of size. And by doing this, it separates them into elements. So that brings us to the end of the science portion. So everything that my team and I have worked on for these past two weeks, it's important to remember that this isn't just useful for the moon. It can also be useful for uh, missions beyond the moon to Mars or even farther. It's useful to test all of these technologies and life support systems and all of these things on the moon before we go to Mars, because if one of these untested systems goes to Mars and you're nine months away from help, there's not much you can do if the system fails. If we test these systems first on the moon and then take them to Mars, it'll be much more efficient. So um, this was uh, pretty short. So uh, we have a lot more detailed presentation and we're putting it into a research paper that's going to the um, Astro Materials Research and Exploratory <coughs> Science um, Department of NASA. So um, just another fun fact, um, there's actually the longest uh, lunar eclipse going on like literally right now as you're going in moon presentation um, for the 21st century and it's on the other side of the planet so we can't see it <laughs> but um so acknowledgements real quick um mrs baggio honestly we really could not have done any of this without you um you are such a big role model for i, I want to say all of us um, we all see how hard you work and we really appreciate you um Again, to the C staff, 
Um, you guys were awesome. You guys were awesome people and awesome uh, chaperones and mentors to us. And we're very grateful for you. To our mentors, Dr. Kathleen Vander Caden and Ms. Sarah Dietrich, um, even though they were in Houston, Texas, uh, while we were here, um, they were a really big asset to our work. And we would not have been able to do this without them. They're so informative and they're just amazing. Um, to the C's externs, thank you for your guidance. Um, thank you to the CSR for, using, for letting us use your facility, as well as NASA Johnson Space Center for your amazing tour, and Texas Space Grant Consortium for sponsoring this event. So, I'm going to go down below and talk about our experiences. And then we'll do questions. Yeah. <laughs> For me, before coming here, I really didn't think about any kind of planetary science. I was more of like an astronomy person, you know, stars, galaxies, that sort of thing. My dress, you know. <laughs> um, but it was really interesting being in charge of science for this mission because I know nothing. I knew nothing about geology before coming here, and now I just know so much. It's crazy. I know stuff about all over the moon, and it's just something I never really considered, and I think I will now. Well, so I'm going to be just stole what I was going to say. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing, kind of. I've always been more of an extragalactic astronomer kind of girl. Like, I've never really thought much about planetary science or the moon, so when I was assigned to this project, I was a little nervous about how it was going to turn out, but I've had a wonderful experience. Everyone here has been so great to work with, and it's so nice to be around people who are interested in the same thing as me. And I think my astronomy horizons have been widened a bit by working with the moon because I mean, there's more interesting stuff than just stars up there. Now I know that. Um, similar to what Alex said, um, I feel really grateful to be around so many people who are like really like-minded and, and have an interest in space science because um, many of my friends at home like don't have an interest in this kind of topic at all. And I'm just really grateful to see people in the same who want to pursue the same field as me. And kind of what Alex also said um, um, about the, um, the moon was. But I didn't know anything about the moon before coming here, but with the pre-arrival work and this, I learned so much that I will for sure hopefully use someday. And touring um, the NASA Johnson Space Center, like I have ambitions for going into astronomy. And after seeing the facility, it, does just, um, it just solidified my ambitions. And even if I have to branch out, I know I can maybe find a home at NASA. This was a tremendous two weeks uh, for myself. Um, just opportunity after opportunity, just meeting so many amazing people, so many people who are just extremely knowledgeable about their subject um, and getting to meet um, all of the other interns. It was really um, just a great opportunity to get to um, meet people who are just so smart and intelligent um, and hardworking. So I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I hope to see you guys and keep in touch again. Questions? Yes, Trevor. So you mentioned uh, about the, the Kilo Power project. Do y'all know the dimensions or how big it is? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. I actually do. In the back? Is that the center of my face? I saw a little bit a few months ago. They were talking about how they found some caves. Uh, I mean, since the page structure on the yes. don't consider uh, using or integrating any of that and maybe the uh, lunar habitat too. So, part of our free work is actually learning about the lava tubes that are on the moon. And the main advantage of them, obviously, is that you have so many feet of runway between you and the surface that, first of all, the temperature is constant. Second of all, you don't have to worry about meteorites or cosmic radiation, really. But our issue with the lava tubes and the reason we decided not to put our habitat there was that. I think mainly we were concerned about stability in it, solar power. Okay, so well, we were originally considering solar power and that was one of our, the factors that influenced that decision. But um, we were concerned about limitation of communication because we have to set up a remote station outside the lava tube. And the locations of the lava tubes on the moon were not really, they didn't fit with our landing site criteria. So that ultimately forced us to choose to build on the surface. Um. You stated earlier in your presentation that the uh, moon was warmer. I mean, you just said that in the, uh, in the lava tubes that the temperature is constant. Do you know the average temperature on the surface of the moon? 
Um, so when I was saying that the moon was um, warm, I was saying compared to liquid oxygen. So liquid oxygen is a liquid at 100 degrees below the temperature of the lunar surface during the nighttime. I think that's like around like almost 200 degrees, negative 200 degrees Fahrenheit on the nighttime. And liquid oxygen is way below that. So that's what I meant by warm. I can tell you that the average temperature within the lava tubes is negative 23 degrees Celsius, and that's like being held steady and more towards the middle of the moon. So I would assume that the average surface temperature is either around there or a little low. So what do you think about the potential of bringing some of this other um, nuclear technology back to Earth from the moon? I think that would be a great opportunity for us, considering the current um, global warming problem we have going on. Because, like I mentioned, helium three is a very clean source of power. However, I think it's a long way in the future. Looking at what MIT has been trying to do with fusion and the limited results they've had, we have a long way to go before we can do it. But it's definitely it has potential. Any other questions? I'd actually like to add a bit more to that. Sorry. <laughs> so one of the things that we studied in our pre-work was the potential of you having helium-3 plants on the moon that sent energy back to Earth. So probably bringing helium-3 back to Earth for processing is not the best idea, I would say. I think it's good to use helium-3 for power on Earth, but we can create the energy remotely on the moon and beam it back to the Earth to be received. Any more questions? Please thank you guys so me much. And thank you. Because I can't really zoom in. Oh, you can? Okay. I didn't know if you did it for the lighting purposes or if you did it for like the ceiling. Like right there would be right there would be sufficient. See? It's getting it gets rid of a lot of the ceiling, the top ceiling part. Is that um, fine or you want uh, me to go back? Like, you, you had it better the other way a second ago. A second ago you had these lights off the screen. There you go. Now if you let go of it, right there. Is that good? Yeah. That at least got rid of, a, of the lighting part. I got you. So, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like we're cutting them off right there. And you can't zoom in. You know how you can't like like that's live right now on yeah. YouTube. So I got, yeah, that, that's a goal. That's probably going to be better because it's not when you enlarge the screen. If you're looking at your home computer, you at least are getting more of, the, of them standing and recognizing the faces. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Our next group is the astronomy group. Please join me in welcoming astronomy. I'm Finn. I'm uh, going to be a senior and I'm from Dallas, Texas. Hi, I'm Nathan Reynolds. I'm a rising junior and I'm from Owensboro, Kentucky. Hello, I'm Samuel Jung. I'm a rising senior and I'm from Dallas, Texas. Hi, I'm Sunny Shratria and I'm from here in Austin and I'm going to be a rising senior. Hi, I'm Meryl Kiyabowski. I'm from Walton, Connecticut and I'm a rising senior. Hello, my name is Sunari Patel. I'm from Dallas, Texas and I'm going to be a rising senior. So as we mentioned, we're the astronomy team, and over the past two weeks, we've worked to measure the light curve of an asteroid named Yulia. 
So I'm going to quickly outline the process that we use throughout the entire experience, but later in the presentation, we'll go more in depth on each step. So we began by gathering the visual data or the images, then calibrating them so that we could read them better. Then we used a program to find the photon count of the asteroids and the stars in the background. Then we used the photon count to find the magnitude of the stars and the compared to the asteroids. Finally, we eliminated as much error as we could and mapped the brightness over time, which is essentially the light curve. So some really basic knowledge, what is an asteroid? Well, an asteroid is a mostly rocky object that orbits the sun. Um, most of them exist between Mars and Jupiter in the main asteroid belt and were formed from leftover dust and gases 4.6 billion years ago during the formation of the solar system. So the specific asteroid we were measuring was Yulia, and it is a near-Earth asteroid, meaning that it is in the proximity of Earth. Uh, it is categorized as an Amora asteroid, meaning that it never crosses Earth's path. However, there is a possibility that over time, its orbit could change. So you might be wondering why we bother studying near-Earth asteroids. Well, as you can see from the map, this is the number of bolide events that have occurred. And so basically we study them just to make sure we can predict if an asteroid is going to be coming in contact with Earth's atmosphere. So as I mentioned, our asteroid is named Yulia, and it was discovered by scientist Eric W. Elst in 1991 at the European Southern Observatory. So the first step in our process was to collect the images. Our images were collected by our mentor, Dr. Reese, who spent six hours and 48 minutes collecting the images over the course of one night at the McDonald Observatory in West Texas. She used the Otto Struve 2.1 meter telescope that's pictured in the corner. And the conditions that night were actually cloudy, which could um, cause some error in our final results. As I mentioned, our final product is the light curve. But what a light curve is, is it's a map of the brightness over time of an asteroid. The brightness actually varies due to irregularities in the spinning of the asteroid as well as the shape. So by analyzing the light curve, we can actually deduct the shape, the size, and the rotation of an asteroid. So now I'm going to show some visuals of Yulia in the night sky and in our image analysis program called Astro Image J. So if everyone could look up at the screen and take a guess as to which dot you think Yulia is. All right. Was anyone right? Yeah. Yeah, I showed it to you. It's pretty cool. So congratulations if you got it right, because it's pretty difficult to differentiate between a star and an asteroid based on just one picture, which is why we use a bunch of pictures and we create a stack and we blink through them um, to see which dot is moving. And this method works because an asteroid orbits the sun just like a planet does, so you can see it moving across the screen. And now I'm going to show a quick video that I made. Um, so I compiled about half the images that Dr. Reese took, and you can pretty clearly see which one is the asteroid. It's moving pretty fast. Um, so here I just have three images, and you can see Yulia's path from through the sky. And real quick, this is kind of interesting. You can see this little blob right there. You can see all the images, and that's actually a galaxy. Um, so now that you're familiar with Yulia's location, I'm going to um, talk about some calibrating stuff. So on the left is a bias frame, uh, which basically means it's a short exposure of the CCD chip in the camera. And you take a bias frame by taking a picture as fast as you can on the camera before the camera has a chance to focus. Um, and theoretically, there should be no exposure in the camera or no photons, no light let in. And the ultimate goal of taking a bias frame is so that you can subtract it from the original image and get rid of any noise. Um, on the right is dark frame, and it's similar to a bias frame, except you take the dark frame at the same temperature and for the same amount of time that you're taking the original images, so it's not just a quick flash. 
and you keep the camera cap on it so it's dark. But we actually didn't end up having to use the dark framing for ours because the pixels were very similar to the original image. And then in the middle, we have a flat frame, which basically measures pixel variation. Um, and a flat frame is supposed to represent both the telescope and the camera, which is why you can see some dust particles up there that are in the shapes of donuts and they're out of focus. And the goal is to make a master bias, master dark, and master flat frame um, so that you can subtract it from the main image. And here's an example of an original image versus the new calibrated one. And you can see the one on the right is much clearer. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about Yulia, <laughs> now that you know a little bit more about Yulia and bias flat frames and all that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the program that we used. It's called Astro Image J, and what it is is that it's a basic photometry tool with a variety of different functions. It's mostly used for image analysis, bless you. Um, but with it, a user can upload image sequences and stacks, subtract bias, dark, and flat, play, flat frames, which we learned about earlier, um, gather various data about a multitude of celestial bodies, all of which must be in some sort of uploaded image because you can't really get data on what you don't have. And it can also produce light programs. So this is the Astro Image J user interface. It looks like this. And as you can see, you can invert the colors to your preferences, but they're still the same values for everything. As you can see by the green circle, Julia, it looks exactly the same. OK, so now I'm going to talk about one of the most important tools that we used um, in Astro Image J. And what it does is that it measures the full width half maximum, or W or FWHM, or as I like to call it, no, I'm kidding, don't call that. Nobody should call that. <laughs> but basically what it is is that it's the star's full width at half of its peak value. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute, Sonia, what does that even mean? Like, um, so that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but I have a better visual coming on, coming in later on, so stay tuned. Um, anyways, um, so FWHM is extremely useful and provides a common measurement of width across the board, like for all types of astronomers. As you can see by this very pixelated image, there's multiple types of widths that you can get from this image. And FWHM provides the same process for getting the width for all. And what FWHM is used for is deciding aperture sizes. And what apertures are, they're like regions of measurement. And the larger, the larger, or changing the size of the aperture changes the number of pixels you can study. So that's it. Okay, so thanks for staying, for staying tuned. This is the better image. So as you can see at the top of this graph, the peak value is at the very top. And if you divide it in half, you have that line that cuts straight across the graph. And that shaded region that you see is the full width. Right, so you've learned all these things about Astra Image J and all these cool functions, but what are we going to do with them? Oh, we're going to look at the photos and then start analyzing them and get data. All right, so first what you got to do is using the line tool that you talked about, we're going to plot the scene profile, right? And after that, we're going to determine our aperture size, use our aperture tools, and then get the magnitude, all right? So this is a scene profile. So first we have our line tool. Uh, what the line tool does is you draw a line basically over any star that you're looking for. And so what it does is it makes it, it uses that line as the diameter of the star. And after using the diameter, it creates a circle around the star to give you an area of what you're looking at. And so then uh, one of the functions in Astro Image J is an analyze tool. Uh, basically, it just says plot scene profile, and it gives you that graph right there. And you might be wondering, what's scene profile? Well, the scene profile basically just gives you the intensity of the pixels. So how many photons? hit the camera and then how many electrons the camera got from that. And it uh, plots the amount of photons that it received as a function from the center of the radius as you go further out. So the closer you are, the higher the number of photons because it's right in the center of the star. So that's why it peaks at the very beginning and starts to drop down. And so using this, we can determine an aperture size of what we're trying to look for. And so an aperture consists of three things. Uh, the radius of the star, where the background image where the background to the sky, where the background begins, and then where the background ends. So once you have these three things, you can determine an aperture of what you're looking for. And so an Astro Image J gives you, uh, gives you suggestions of what you probably want to use. So it says like radius 9, a background begins 16, background ends at 24. 
And so you do this across multiple stars because each star is in the same size. And so after doing this, you find more or less what aperture you want to use. And in this case, uh, we had we had our, our entire group split up into three smaller groups. So we used three separate apertures. These different apertures were to let in different amounts of light. So my group had the larger aperture, which means we analyzed the larger area around the stars, meaning we got even more light as opposed to the other groups that would have used a smaller aperture and would look more directly at the star. And so this is to have different signal to noise ratios, which is basically telling us how much light is actually coming from the star as opposed to how much light is coming from the background stars or background sky or the atmosphere or just whatever else is in them. And so we have single aperture and multiple aperture. Single aperture is where you're tracking one body that's moving across all the photos. So in this case, it's Yulia. But if you have multiple aperture, you're just looking at the stationary bodies in the photos that just stay there. And so you just click on the spot and it analyzes uh, that spot for every photo. In this case, we have 69 photos in our tool. So this is, an, this is a, an example of the multiple aperture tool. And so in each photo, we have to keep track of what stars we're using. We can't, we want to make sure that T1 in our, in our photo doesn't get changed at all. So we want to go one, two, three, four, five, and we want to keep that pattern the same so that when we're putting all of, that, all of our data into a sheet or a table, it also is uniform. And so we have to plot these stars what we did was we put it in MS Paint and then just wrote the number next to the stars so that we kept track of whether they were. But you have to do that for every photo. And in our case, we also had two separate batches of photos that had slightly different viewing angles. So we have to choose 15 stars for both of them. And you've got to make sure that you keep that in line. And this is an example of what a single aperture looks like. And so as you can see, we have two separate lines, uh, two separate streaks. That's to represent uh, the two separate batches we did. But as you can see, it follows a general curve. And so that's the curve that Yulia was taking. And so you click Yulia as it goes along each photo. And so then you get all these uh, points. And so from that, you'll get your measurements. But then what do you do with your measurements? You're going to calculate magnitude. Now, we have a magnitude scale. So the way magnitude works is basically the lower the number, the brighter the thing you're looking at. So one magnitude difference scales by 2.512 times. So negative 1 is 2.512 times brighter than 0. And so you normally go up to the max of negative 32 and the, and the faintest of positive 32. So at the magnitudes we see from Earth are like the sun is negative 26.74. That's really, 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 really bright. The moon is only negative 12.6. And the North Star, one of the brightest stars, like in the night sky, would be 1.97. And then our human eyes can only see up to about 6 magnitude in a good night sky. So when every single magnitude is a 2.512 scale, when you scale by, or when you change by five magnitude, that's actually a 100 times difference in brightness. So the sun, as compared to the moon, is almost like 10,000 times brighter. So now, uh, we're going to calculate the star magnitude using the photons that we grabbed from the values we calculate, or from the values we got using our apertures. So how, how would you do that? Well, you put it into this, this formula. Negative 2.5 log base 10 of the photons coming from the asteroid in the photo divided by the average number of the average photons coming from every star in the photo plus the instrumental constant. And that's going to give you the difference of the magnitude of the asteroid from the magnitude of the stars in the photo. Now, it's a bit complicated, but you just do that for every single photo and you'll grab the, the magnitude that you're reading for each of the, for the asteroid that you're reading each time. And we're not actually reading the real magnitude, which would be the absolute magnitude. We're reading our instrumental magnitude, which is what our telescope is picking up. And by reading, we don't actually care about what the real magnitude is because we really can't do much with that. But by looking at the differences of magnitude, what we can do is we can look at the period of rotation, we can look at how it's shaped, determining how much the brightness changes, and we can do a whole lot of stuff just based on the number of photons we get because it spins. And that would be instrumental magnitude and apparent magnitude. Error. Um, when analyzing data in AstroImageJ, problems can arise that can affect one's data, uh, such as saturation. Saturation is when a star has a peak of approximately 55,000 in units of pixel count. And um, at 45,000, though, um, we can't get any more electrons out of the image, and the image is unreliable and no longer linear. Um, examples of saturated stars we can use um, are seen there, and they're um, 
and Hunter and Laser Man will be able to tell. But they're kind of like blurry around the edges, and so the pixels are just like, you can't trust them. So. <laughs> um, light dimming and brightening. Due to sky conditions, when astronomical photos are taken, in addition to proximity to other celestial bodies, data can be affected by light dimming and brightening. Um, and light dimming and brightening is difficult to detect in the photograph itself, but it's easy to spot on a light curve with an outlier. So, um, yeah, the, the writing is really light, but um, in the first picture, uh, in the green circle, there's like, there's yogi there. But um, for all we know, it could just be dim for literally any given reason. But when you look at the graph, you can see the outlier and kind of determine that light has some effect. Um, measurement error. Measurement error can interfere with data at any point in the Astro MHJ data analysis process. Um, though AIJ can help with centering the moon stars, bad photometry can affect data. So if you're just not worrying it whatsoever and you don't know where those, where those white stars are, and your red circles look something like that, you have a problem. So, <laughs> I mean, it can help you a little bit, but um, like, yeah, just know what you're centering on when you do it. Um, and the final problem is CCD readout noise causing problems. Um, CCD readout noise is defined as the noise produced by electronics as the charge in the pixels is transferred to the camera. And CCD readout noise is produced by electronics, and an inability to adjust the readout noise can produce erroneous data due to interference in image quality. And what you see the picture there is the um, little pop up thing that you would see on a Mac for adjusting the CCD parameters. And um, actually, in our project, um, my Mac, that, or in the desktop Mac that we used, it wouldn't let us adjust the CCD noise. So we had to like, completely quit working on Mac and use Sonia's PC. Putting it all together. Hello. Um, so once we have, to kind of backtrack, so this is nice. um, once we have all the magnitudes, we get a graph of star magnitudes that looks like this. Um, so each line in that kind of daunting graph represents one star, um, but the values of magnitude, which you can see on that axis, um, aren't actually the important part, it's actually the trend that all of them stack together follow. And they are kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, so even though stars do go through cycles of varying brightness, there are variable stars, um, we attribute most of the changes in this graph um, to the atmospheric interference that we dealt with, um, with the photons coming from the stars. Um, so you can see there are a few inconsistencies in this graph, like that line right there kind of jumps up. Um, and that's due to either a measurement error, as Nathan was talking about, or some other stellar event that caused the light we received from that star to be changed. Um, and that's why we need so many stars, so that we can distinguish magnitude changes um, from the events that we're interested in, like the rotation of Yulia on its axis, um, from the ones that we're very much not interested in, like atmospheric interference. So when we want to find the magnitude of Yulia, um, we use these equa this equation. So bear with me. Uh, Big M in this equation is a really important value because that's a constant, it's kind of our baseline. It's the average of all of the magnitudes for every star in every frame. So that stays the same for every time we use this equation. Um, and then little m is the average for all the stars in one frame. So when you subtract, you get delta m right there. And when you add that, we use that to add to uh, Yulia's measured magnitude to get her actual magnitude. So when you do that for all 69 frames, you get a red line that looks like that. Pretty uneventful at first glance. And that's because we I put it against this green and blue line, which represent um, the average star magnitude and Yulia's measured magnitude, respectively. So the reason Yulia looks so small is because you can see how big these magnitude changes are in relation to the little ones which we're trying to measure. Um, but when you blow, oh, that's been thin, I guess. Um, when you blow it up, you get a graph that looks more like that, and that is in fact our final light curve. Um, it's not on Astro Image J. We gave this data to Dr. Rees, and she used a uh, more advanced, capable program to generate this curve. Um, Astro Image J is free, 
Um, hers is not. <laughs> um, so that probably doesn't look like the one you first saw with Sunari, but we can actually, it was really exciting the first time we saw that, um, because that can tell us a lot about Yulia. So if you, we didn't know that this existed, but we found out pretty recently that JPL actually did a very similar study um, of Yulia, and they got the light curve to be three point, or they got the, uh, the period of Yulia to be 3.25 hours, and ours is 3.53 hours. So that's 8% error. That's really good. We were very happy with that. Um, and then the other exciting thing, I know it was a full 20 minutes ago, but you guys might remember Sunari's presentation about light curves. What do you think it would look like if Yulia was just a sphere, like the light curve? What would that look like? Constant. So like a line? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and this, <laughs> good job. Um, and this is pretty obviously not a line. So there's a lot of jumps and big curves and um, dips back down. Um, and that's because Yulia is not a perfect sphere. It actually has somewhat of a potato shape, um, which is pretty exciting that we have a potato asteroid. So <laughs> we're pretty happy about that. And that's our white curve. So. Oh, one more thing. Nathan has a last word. Um, and the error bars um, we've come up with are still a little optimistic um, due to time constraints and like advanced formulas that we don't know, <laughs> etc. But um, our results vary actually very little from actuality, as we said. And um, the error bar is right, right here. Right there. The, the orange line is the moonrise, and so the error bars become larger when the moonrise occurs. As you can see, the, the, there, or right there, sorry. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, I think we can all agree when I say that this program was phenomenal. Um, before coming here, I was really undecided in what I wanted to pursue in college and as a career. But after talking to so many knowledgeable people, I really feel like I've um, decided on what I want to study in college and even maybe what I want to do as a career. So I'm really grateful for this experience. So growing up, I was always really interested in astronomy and aerospace engineering. And my family used to go watch the space shuttles launch in Cape Canaveral. Um, so I think this is kind of a dream for both me now and my 10 year old self and I'm just really amazed that I got to do this program. Great. So I agree that this is a really marvelous experience like because when we're in school we kind of just like learn things from our teacher we take notes on it we study it we take a test and then we forget all about it. <laughs> so I feel like in this experience I really got to apply what I learned to like real life problem or like real life solution or whatever and I knew it was like contribute to the world of science and that was just such an incredible experience for me. They kind of gave me like an idea of what my path might look like in the future. Yeah, yeah. the CS program is pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> I, I mean for like two weeks they threw like two tons of science at us <laughs> and that's what we've been doing for just the past week, just science. And a part of as a part of the astronomy program, I, I really had no idea what astronomy astronomers did. I knew they took photos of stars, um, but uh, when I first saw the photos of like what we were looking at, I mean it's just dots on like a black screen and you know that's not what you're thinking when you're thinking of like Hubble or like wow really pretty photos and then the more you keep doing it the more you realize it's just like there's a lot of math that I'm doing right now with just photons coming from a star that's like a million miles away, it's way further than that. But uh, there's just uh, there's a lot of applied math that I did, and I'm really I'm really happy that I got to be a part of the astronomy team because uh, there's just a lot of application of things that I I didn't even know was possible, and things I'm actually applying that I've learned, and it's been pretty cool. Um, one particular unexpected thing I learned was that everyone I've met that works in the STEM fields are so passionate about their jobs. I'm so excited to keep learning about the world they live in. And I think CS has helped me for the future and showing me that even though knowing what career you want to pursue is a great thing, like um, there's greater meaning in curiosity and deep conversations with your intern friends. <laughs> and um, in the process of becoming yourself, you're going to be, uh, in the process of becoming the person you're going to be, my inspector is and actually being that person once you get there. 
And I mean, I could be an astronomer, I could be literally anyone else, but now I feel like I have a greater reason to appreciate the process of becoming that person. So. <laughs> I don't really want to go after that. <laughs> yeah, uh, like Samuel said, uh, I think before this, I kind of just thought astronomy was pretty pictures. And I, I don't want to make that sound bad. I was totally down to look at pretty pictures. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. I it, this it was definitely not that. Um, and I can definitely say that I've never. This is gonna sound bad, but I promise it's really good. I've never had so much fun um, doing something that sounds so boring. <laughs> so, and I think a lot of people can attest to that. Like. If you describe what you did for the last two weeks to someone, they'd go, oh, wow, like, that's, you wanted to do that? And you're like, yeah, it was so exciting. So, yeah, it was so exciting. It was really fun. So thank you, everyone. Questions for the astronomy team? Trevor. Uh, so do you know how big this asteroid is? I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, I don't know how valid this is, but we found this like um, Russian data that said it was about like, uh, 77 kilometers. I'm not sure. That doesn't seem right to me, but it, that's what we read online. So <laughs> you can go with that. Um, sure. it's, it's, if I may add, uh, it's kind of hard to translate it, but uh, it's a fairly large one. It could be around 10 to 50 because we don't know. So between 10 and 50 kilometers sounds reasonable for me. Yeah. So maybe it's a reason. So it's a reasonable <laughs> part, yeah. Go with what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I had a question about that uh, reflectivity brightness scale. I was wondering, like, what is zero? Like, how do they decide, like, zero? Uh, like, Thing. We, learned. We, we learned this before. It was just it's just the scale that's been used since like the Greeks. Yeah, since the Greeks. And uh astronomers just didn't want to change it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it stayed like that. Ask the Greeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Greek. If the Greeks decided the brightest uh, star has magnitude one. They just decided and then you know created the catalogs and then then it gets physical, um, you realize that, well, they had to eyeball if they were in that two size, and now we know there are stars brighter, and that's how the zero came. We okay. still know the zero, you know, yeah. so they started from one to six, and then you realize, oh, we have to extend it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the astronomers. Obviously, Mrs. Baggio, our mentor, Dr. Rees, and the Texas Space Grant Consortium, CSR, NASA, and this entire C staff. Thank you.
Please join me in welcoming the flood response team. Okay, good afternoon everyone. We are the Magic Flood Response Team mentored by the one and only Mr. Brent Porter. And my name is Archika and I am from Seattle, Washington and I will be a rising junior. My name is Irish Bill McKenzie and I'm a rising junior from Austin, Texas. My name is Emily Lee. I'm from San Francisco, California, and I'm also a rising senior. Wait, I am a rising senior. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jenna Zay, and I'm a rising senior from Austin, Texas. So what is MAGIC? MAGIC, is, um, Magic stands for Mid-American Geospatial Information Center, and it's a part of the Center for Science and uh, for Space Research, and they are in charge of uh, giving out uh, remote sensing data to the general public and federal and state agencies. So how does this relate to flooding? So flooding is the number one most common natural disaster in the United States. And between 2004 and 2015, um, individual insurance um, claims average at around $42,000. And for insurance companies, they would pay $3.5 billion annually only on floods. So three common obstacles that um, flood response teams usually see are um, predicting events, uh, predicting events accurately. Um, as our population continues to grow and we start to use more and more land, uh, flood patterns are starting to change as well as occur more often. Uh, another problem is visualizing flooding contextually. Um, it's the job of flood responders to take the flood information and make it so that it's, more, it's easily more readable for the general public. And lastly, communication with local entities are, is key to keep people safe and out, and out of high risk and dangerous areas. So our overall objective is to, um, is to visualize and flood data to help emergency responders help people in um, flood areas as well as predict future uh, floods and help mitigate flood yeah. All right. So our main oh, okay. So our main objective of our main objective was to create a Python script that would take quantitative precipitation estimates or QPE data from the National Weather Services or NWS site and uh, output the visualization into a web map application along with other data set symbolizations in order to help emergency responders best predict the geographic and demographic consequences of flooding. So this seems kind of broad, so we broke it down into three tasks. First, we had to find the data, then we had to map the data, and then we finally had to integrate the data into a web mapping application. The first step was pretty easy because NWS uh, updates a daily PAR file, which has a net CDF file, which basically has all of the QP data that we want to show. The second step, uh, we use uh, using ArcGIS software, which basically takes data sets and outputs the information on mapping on, on maps. And the third step, we uh, as we integrated the data into a web mapping application using Leaflet, that's a very nice uh, JavaScript API, and also using HTML, CSS, and other and JavaScript. Yeah, so. So before Harish goes into more details of the mapping process of actually rendering QPE data, uh, I'm going to very quickly start our Python script because it's going to take a while to run. And so right here, you can see that in this folder, we have a netcdf.par file. And so this is the raw data set that we're going to be using and creating into a layer. And so I'm just going to minimize that and click the green run button and hope that nothing pops up like an error. <laughs> OK, so it's now running. You can see the three little characters. Um, OK, and so that's about it there. And we can go back to. the demo for the manual process. Okay, so this demo is basically a very sped up version of what would be the manual process for um, getting the QPE data from the NWS site and putting it on a map. 
So because it's so long and it's obviously set up like four times, I actually like made a quick flowchart just so you could like keep track of all the steps while watching the video. So first we had to extrapolate, we had to extract the data from the star files and then uh, the, the net CDF files, right? We had to put, we had to convert that to a raster layer, which is basically an image layer that only contains RGB values. Then we had to apply a color ramp to highlight the QP data and like that. And then we converted the, the image layer to a point layer because uh, image layers only contain RGB values while point layers actually contain data that we're interested in. Then we kind of deleted unnecessary uh, values. First, we clipped it to the Texas boundaries, which are more or less uh, mid-American boundaries because you know magic. And then we deleted all the zero values because in um, because they're not uh, they're unnecessary in looking at quantitative precipitation estimates and also a uh, slow data handling. Then we altered the map. Uh, we um, we predicted the data the map to another coordinate system in order to make it consistent with other layers. And then we also altered a field just to make it uh, more specific in terms of what we we're doing. And then we took that process point layer like that, which you can see there, we took that process point layer, which had all the data and converted it into a raster layer, which had uh, the image and the RGB values. Then we applied the symbology again to highlight the QPE data. And then we finally created map services, which is basically pushing it to the internet and creating URL based off the point and raster layers. Okay, so that's generally what the magic process would look like. And according to our mentor, which I would trust, because he is the one who has to basically manually do this every single day when the QPE data comes in. And so he says that this basically takes around 30 to 40 minutes to process one data set. And QPE data comes in once every day. And so that might not seem like a lot of time at first, but then when you cumulatively start to add everything up, it becomes a very, very large amount of time being wasted in the manual process. And so that's why we decided to do the automated process. And this is done running now. And so we can just check out what uh, the Python script just outputted. And so basically in this main method here, uh, you can see that there is a for loop that goes through and finds all of the files that were inside this directory that I showed you before and now this is empty. Um, so it loops through all of the different our files inside that and then runs through all of these methods in order to render the data into a form that we want into a form that we can actually publish to a web service and look at the data visualization and so we start off with all of these uh, different methods that goes through each of the individual processes that Harish talked about earlier and when we're done we have actually a properties file here that basically says, okay, so this is the file that we were processing and all of these different methods, were they successful or not? And so we have basically try catch blocks that tell us whether there was an error while processing the data. And if there was, it would output a failure. And so this is a good type of documentation and a debugger help for later on if something like is messed up or the data is not complete or something like that. Um, and so after that, we have ArcMap, which we can open here. And then we can see that the layers that have been processed. Um, so this is the final points layer. You can see that the uh, points are actually like little circles there. And so that's the points layer. And then there's data being stored in there. And then the raster layer is more like an image, like Harish said. So it's a lot more clear, as you can see there. And so all the symbology and the coloring is there. And this is all the clip data without the zero values. Um, and so in the Python code, basically you can see here we have about like 261 code and then the methods, we have a total of 12 different methods to deal with a lot of the different tools inside our Py. And all right, that's about it for the Python script. And let's move on here. Yeah, so after learning how to process and ultimately visualize the data, we wanted to reach our end goal, which was to create a comprehensive web application that both the general public and emergency responders can use and analyze. So there are three really main components to doing so. The first one being adding features and layers and base maps to our web application, giving basically a foundation to what exactly the people using our application are going to be seeing. 
Second, we wanted to add a component of functionality to our application, which allows them to perhaps turn layers on and off or change opacity and things like that, allowing them to, to ultimately interact with our application and figure out what they really want to see and narrow in on that. And the last one would be to integrate it into an accessible user interface. So this is basically just making it look good and making it easy to use. Yeah, so we all chose different layers that we wanted to visualize within our web applications. We're going to go around and say why exactly we chose them and what they were. So Jenny's going to start off with her quantitative precipitation forecast layer. So the acronym for this is actually QPF, which some of you might realize that this is really similar to the QPE data that we were showing earlier with the automation. And actually, why we chose to have QPF data in conjunction with QPE is that QPE is actually an estimate of the rain that has already occurred. So it's measuring the precipitation that has already fallen in different regions. And so that data paired with forecast data, which is uh, looking into the future, is actually more useful in terms of our purpose for the web application, which is to say, um, predict where floods are likely to occur and how large they're going to be and what impact they're going to have. And so I chose this layer. As so I decided to choose uh, soil moisture <coughs> as the element that I'm going to be tracking. Soil moisture is great for um, trying to detect whether or not there's going to be a flood because while um, soil moisture will indicate whether the soil is saturated or not, the more saturated the soil is, the more likely there's going to be one on top of that soil. And as a result, more likely it's going to, there's going to be a flood occurrence. Just to explain what's over, just to explain what's happening in the map, um, high soil moisture in the blue and low soil moisture in the red. So I chose to track the the lake levels in Texas, and these are basically each circle uh, symbolizes a lake or reservoir in Texas. And the more red or larger a circle is, then the more cold it is, which obviously means that in it, in the excess precipitation, that area would be more prone. Yeah, so along with a lot of the meteorological data and environmental data, I decided to take a more human demographic aspect to what I want to visualize on the map. So now that we know that these certain trends are going to happen and we have predictions and estimates, what, how will it affect specific people in specific places? So empirically, areas with high poverty concentration are often hit hardest by floods specifically because they lack resources, insurance, and individual mobility in those emergency situations. So I decided to visualize this specifically for the state of Texas, looking at counties and different poverty concentrations within those counties with the darker purple signifying a higher concentration of poverty and lighter purple signifying a perhaps more affluent area. And as the final map layer that we decided to symbolize, um, I also created a map for population data. So basically, the uh, it's population density by county. So the darker green means a higher population density in that county. And also the blue dots represent the population sizes of different like major cities in Texas. And so this is also a basically a good tool to use in conjunction with Archica's data about poverty because, you know, in larger cities, you're definitely going to have a lot more infrastructure and a lot more people that need to be evacuated in the event of a huge emergency, for, especially for flooding purposes. And so you have to be able to plan which regions are going to be more at risk. And that's why this is also a useful just base data to have. And so now we're going to be looking at the web application that we made, and Archica is going to demonstrate some of its capabilities. Yeah, so as you can see above, this is our web application. And we have a couple of, or quite a few different functionalities within the application. So here you have a map, and you can zoom in, perhaps closer to Texas, if that's what you're interested in. And we have a lot of layers, and these are our layer toggles, which essentially turn layers on and off. So if I click poverty, it'll turn that layer on, population density, and soil moisture, lake levels, etc. And then you can do multiple at a time. So poverty and lake levels, if that was a component or combination I was interested in. And along with that, you can also change the opacity of those layers. So how much you really see those layers. So let's say I wanted to see lake levels a little bit less because I want to focus more on the poverty layer. So I can turn that down. I can even just completely remove it. Or I can turn it up and make it much bolder. So that's part of our functionality. And we have that for each layer on this side. We also have different base map options. So if you're feeling a little bit creative and you want to look at it in a different way, we can go to imagery, 
or we can go to physical or especially shaded relief, which will also help us visualize the next part of the demo that I'll be doing. But before we get to that, we're going to look at this part or this sidebar on the right. And there are two different components really here, which is QPE and QPF, which as you remember is basically the precipitation data. So for the QPE, it's estimates in the past and there are a couple of different dates. So I can turn this for the 20, uh, for June 20th on, and then I can turn it off for June 21st on, turn it off and then June 22nd. And as you can see, this changes as every day, the estimated precipitation amounts are changing. And I can also change the opacity of those two. And for the forecast, this is from just this week, so the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. And we have different precipitation forecasts that will align on top, on top of the previous layers. So now let me do a little bit more like an interesting demo. So let's say I have a hypothetical family member that lives in Texas. And I want to figure out if I perhaps know that a flood is coming to their area, how much damage are they going to perhaps be at risk for? So as Harish previously mentioned, a lot of the times like uh, lake levels and how lake, lake, okay, I'll just stop right there. Um, lake levels um, can indicate uh, whether they're more at risk for overflowing during the instance of a flood. So. Uh, if I want to go here, we also have pop-ups. So as you can see, you can see it says uh, Lamar County's percentage in poverty is 19.9%, and that's all interactive with each county that you click on. And then um, we also have lake levels. So say that my family lives in Lamar County. So I'm going to go zoom in there, and I see, oh no, there seems to be a lake that is very full. And if you click on it, it says it's 94.7% full as of today. This is data that is today and dynamically changing every day. So that's pretty cool. I mean, it's not cool that it's full, and that's not really good for my hypothetical family, but it's pretty cool in the other sense that you can visualize all this data interactively. So that was a quick demo of our interactive map. And now that you've seen our end product, we're going to go a little bit over the different challenges and the lessons we learned throughout this experience. So personally, something that I really learned and also served as a challenge was a collaborative workflow. So we all chose to work in a group, and as you can see, there are a lot of different components using ArcGIS, Python, and HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I think it was really important for us to figure out how we wanted to distribute this and how we wanted the workflow to go throughout the week to make sure that we got this all done on time. And while um, our solution to that came a little bit late, it was still early enough, especially with the guidance of this reporter, that we could get it all together in one comprehensive web application that you just saw. And something that I really liked about this program was that, I mean, I don't know about all of you, but I never really envisioned myself four months ago saying, hey, I've like interned in like a NASA related program, especially as a high schooler. And I think this really, um, really makes me more confident about what I can do in the future and what I have done in the past and really enables me to look for more opportunities and ways to further myself in different fields that I've learned in this experience that I really like. So um, one challenge that I faced uh, was being able to interact with so many different programming languages at once. So before I came to this internship, I really only had experience with Java and minimal Python. As you can see by our web application, we use JavaScript, a lot of APIs, we use Python, HTML, CSS. We had a lot of web design uh, work and we had to integrate all these different parts together. And I think that was a challenge that eventually we pushed through. And yeah, a lesson that I learned is basically more coding content because I realized that there are a lot of there are a lot of resources everywhere and I'm not too constricted. I can do a little more free. And I also found that coding can be used to create a lot of cool visualizations as you guys saw in the web. So coming into this program, um, I think for flood response, we have the option of things. So this is all new to us. Um, the challenge was that since it's new, we had to spend a lot of time learning how to do it and a lot of sleepless nights worrying about whether or not this code's going to work or another error is going to pop up. Um, but in the end, I thought it was really fun. It might have seemed a little boring um, going from like no background, but it is really fun. I had a blast doing this. And um, a lesson that I learned was that. Or like something that I can take away from this is that um, I don't usually work in a large group when it comes to um, coding. It's usually very individual. But now that I've like programmed in a group, kind of, it's going to build my experience.
Okay, so we talked about how difficult it is to like debug code, I think. And it is really difficult. Like, I'm not kidding here. Uh, we spent, okay, we thought we were done with the automation code like last week. And then we started debugging and we were finishing this like yesterday. <laughs> so it is really difficult. And this web application, let me tell you a really funny story. We were actually trying to debug this, the base map layers especially, during lunch today. <laughs> and so basically, like, I think the challenge here is just like managing your timeline and then just trying to get things done on time, even though there are so many challenges ahead. It's like um, that quote that we have everywhere on our lanyards and everything. Failure is not an option. Just keep solving problems and then sometime you'll get there. And I think we did and I'm really proud of us for doing that. And one extra thing. Uh, when we were debugging, uh, definitely lesson learned is pay attention to the specifics and the details because we missed an R, like a character R. We misspelled a word and it was all broken. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, that's like this program was just really, really fun and I just learned a lot through all of this. Yeah, so if you couldn't already tell, we're really grateful for our experience and we have a lot of thank yous. So thank you to like all the software we used that made our lives 10 times easier. And then um, along with the Texas State Spring Consortium and the UT Austin and NASA and CSR and everything that everyone's been saying. But specifically, thank you to Mr. Porter. Um, if you've never met Mr. Porter, you should definitely talk to him because not only is he an amazing mentor, but he's a hilarious person. He wears like the best Honey shirts and like always roasts us and it's so fun. Like, <laughs> not gonna lie, it's so great. And um, he also is able to like solve a lot of problems. So for example, like last night I got three hours of sleep trying to debug something that was reported today at lunch did in three minutes. So yeah, he's pretty smart that way, not gonna lie. And of course, Miss Begio, like you've made an incredible program and this is just so amazing that you could do this for us and we're all really inspired by all the activities and um, ways that you've allowed us to see a whole new world and a whole new like outer space universe, whatever now that right. So yeah, basically, thank you, Space Grandma. Yeah. <laughs> so how many of you uh, now will possibly major in computer science? Yeah, I've wanted to major in computer science for a few years now, but I also want to do a double in electrical engineering, so that's fun. Um, I think, yeah, I think everyone here wanted to be like either like something to do with computer science, computer programming. Coming to this program really opened my eyes in like the engineering major, now kind of like interested. Uh, yeah, so what Ms. Kidman was saying yesterday about computational engineering and like computer scientist engineering, I kind of appreciated that. That was kind of my plan for a long time now. Yeah. Um, like everyone else, I was also interested in computer science, which is why I specifically chose this group. But what was really special was that we learned how to apply it in a really amazing way and have an end product that we really love. So, yeah. Join me in congratulating.
but about a month in, it had unexpected and unpredicted failure of laser one, which caused ISAT to operate for one month periods out of every uh, three to six months in a year in order to extend the time series of measurements, particularly for the IC machines. The last laser failed on October 11, 2009, and many attempts were made to restart the satellite, but was finally retired in February of 2010. It was then decommissioned in August of 2010 and re-entered the atmosphere in the same moment. So, like I said before, it had three lasers. So laser one equals L1, and the um, letter behind L1 stands for the campaign number. I said it had 18 campaigns. So laser one was a laser that failed, so it only had one campaign. Laser two um, had uh, three campaigns between September 20th, 2003 and June 2004. They shut it off because they wanted to conserve it in case it, they were afraid they was going to break again. So they started up laser three. Um, so that ran for about four years, and they turned back. Um, they turned back on laser two, and that ran until it died. So our mission was to um, effectively utilize ISAT data to analyze the satellite's technicalities. Uh, we wanted to predict and understand Earth's trends through the mapping and visualize authentic satellite recordings with uh, GMT. All right, so the program we used to create the maps was GMT, which is also called generic mapping tools. And basically what GMT is, is it's a, it's a command line uh, library and it's like a shell program. So what it does is you can manipulate, you can manipulate data in Cartesian data sets and geographic data sets into maps, and you can also um, add features on maps. So these are the parameters you had to work with, at least just a tiny snapshot of it, because uh, I said the unique thing about it is that it only carried one instrument, which was glass. Usually when we send satellite stuff, it's like loaded with a bunch of different stuff so we can get like as much information as we can. We only had glass, but glass measured quite a few things. Uh, I think it was about 178 variables they collected over its 18 campaigns. Uh, so we chose to, of course we can't do all of them, it's an overwhelming amount of data, but we chose 10 of those 178 that we decided would look uh, best on maps. So we would have a sort of a, we'd be able to quantify the data and see what it means in real life rather than just on a spreadsheet like a bunch of numbers. So these are examples of some of them. Uh, this is the code we use to uh, generate the maps, at least a part of it. Um, like, William, like William said, it's a, GMT is a library of different modules that we can use. So you could take as input a uh, list, for example, uh, two or three columns, longitudes, latitudes, and then the third variable we would change. So, uh, like I said, we had 10 parameters, and we'd run this for every parameter for every campaign. And basically what we would do is we generate a grid, which would map each of those parameters to a longitude and a latitude point, a coordinate, and then we create a color overlay, which is uh, the color generates the function of whatever the third variable is, so it would adjust itself based on the scales. So for example, elevation would be in meters while um, we did co-elevation which is in degrees. So we'd have to adjust that on our own. And then finally, we'd create a scale on the bottom which would serve as a key or a legend to kind of get an idea of what it is that um, the distributions show on the maps. Uh, this, for example, is elevation. Yeah, so with our 10 parameters, the first one we decided the map was elevation because this is typically the most basic one. And generally, uh, the GMT and ISAT data was pretty accurate. As you can tell, in the mountainous areas, you can see the red spots, which basically means it's very high elevation. So with our scale, what we did was the minimum we set to about negative 2,000 meters, and the maximum we set to 5,000 meters. So the blue area is around zero meters, and you can tell that's right because it's the ocean. And also, when we analyzed the data, we took a look at the max and min values, and they're pretty close to the actual max and min values of the Earth's mountains and valleys. Uh, additional, additionally to the maps, we also decided to make some graphs 
And what this tells us is the elevation goes through cycles and it tends to stay around the same. It's pretty consistent. You can see that around the L2C, it goes up and then slowly comes down. And then when it hits L3H, it goes back up and just continues in the cycle. Okay, so another variable we chose to map was co elevation. Like Santino said earlier, it's in degrees and it is the angle at which ISAT is pointing towards the Earth. It's on a scale of zero to five degrees, zero being that the satellite is directly facing the Earth. It can be seen in L2F, which is the map on the top left, right there. And um, it's fine, I can just show them. It's that top left one right there. It can be seen that in equatorial zones, the map is much lighter than it is anywhere else. And that's indicating that when the satellite is looking directly in that area, it is facing out the Earth. But then when it crosses a certain latitude on the top and on the bottom, it gets slightly darker because when ISAT is approaching the poles, it angles and measures at an angle. And then one very obvious trend with co-elevation is those green spaces that can be seen in L2F in the Pacific Ocean and along certain tracks. And those green spaces are zones where ISAT performed octa octagonal maneuvers to recalibrate itself so that it would be measuring data accurately. Okay, this is the graph for co-elevation. Not much can be seen from laser three, which is in the middle right there. But if you look at laser two at the very beginning from A to C and laser two at the end from D to F, you can see that co-elevation gets increasingly lower as the laser dies out. So the way ISAT um, records elevation is through these things called waveforms, where it basically, when the satellite rotates around the Earth, like we saw in uh, the Grace group showed us, they, were, they have these ground tracks. So essentially what it does is it like unspools these tracks and makes them flat and then creates sort of like a two-dimensional shape of the, um, the surface. So here we see the canopies of the trees. There's peaks and, and valleys there. And then here on the ocean, we also, it also shows how it outlines these little ridges that are underwater that we can't see. So when ISAT uses glass, use glass to measure this data, it, ISAT waveform and elevation data was affected by glass saturation. And um, the parts that were most heavily affected for ISAT data were those with high transmit energy, which would be when lasers are like fresh and new and they haven't been eroded yet, as they were when the gold and indium um, reacted with each other. Um, these the satellites had the satellite measured with very high transmit energy, and that had the glass had a very strong effect on that when it was fresh and new. But then you can see in L two F, which is the top right map right there, that most of that is gray because the laser is dying out and there's not much effect on anything at all because the glass is just not measuring accurately anymore because the laser just isn't working. Um, another place that is very heavily affected by glass saturation is locations in throughout all the maps that have high reflectivity, which is places like polar ice caps and sea ice and snow. Um, so, saturation correction. <laughs> Um, affects the range of ISAT data so that it's far too long for what's actually accurate. And that makes elevation, which you saw a couple maps ago, that was blue, seem much lower than it actually is. And it can actually affect elevation by tens of centimeters, which is significant in a satellite like ISAT because its main purpose, or one of its main purposes, is to measure elevation. And if it can't do that accurately, then it's not doing much of anything at all. So saturation correction algorithms were created to ensure that a corrected range was shown when um, mapping ISAT data. This is a graph of saturation correction throughout all 18 campaigns. And you can see that until L2D, the graph steadily decreases 
showing that there was less of a need for saturation correction. At L2D, E, and F, you can see that there's a sudden spike in the need for saturation correction because heat was turned on to make the lasers last longer than they would have otherwise. Okay, kurtosis, another variable we map, is a statistical measure and it um, is it compares the combined weight of the tails of a distribution curve, which can we see in that graph right there, to the center of the distribution. And a large kurtosis indicates that the tails are very wide, and that can that in these graphs right there at the top, for in the top row right there, like L1A, where it's red near the poles, that means that the kurtosis is very large. And then, oh no. So fun. Um, there's also very there's very small kurtosis when the tails of a graph are much lower and less extreme than a normal distribution. In that graph right there on the left, the normal distribution is black, and you can see that there's negative or low kurtosis in the red graph at the bottom, red curve at the bottom, but positive or very high kurtosis on that blue graph right there. And low kurtosis, just to add on, is the exact opposite of high kurtosis in that equatorial zones had lower kurtosis than the poles. Again, with the kurtosis graph, it's similar with the saturation correction graph and the coalition graph in that if you look at L2D, L2A through C and B through F, you can see that um, kurtosis drops uh, as the laser dies out. So skew is the distortion of the curve of the skew is the distortion of the curve of the receiving laser pulse, and it is essentially bound through the angle of the topography of the terrain. And basically, if you look at the bottom left corner, you can see that if the laser hits the ground that is at a negative angle, the skew will be positive. But if the curve of the skew will be positive. But if the skew hits the ground that is at a positive angle, the curve of the skew will be negative. And you can't really see it because the graphs are so small, but if you look up there at El Grey, the more elevated areas, they have a skew where the flatter areas, because they're at an angle, the flatter areas don't really have much of a skew, they're more flat. However, so this data, it's relatively new. We haven't really been able to find it on the graph, so we don't know. We really haven't been able to figure out what that is. So that is our goal for being a um, statistical parameter, it's hard to really find a physical interpretation of what it means for something to have like low skew, high skew, or kurtosis. So these two variables in particular are ones that are we have graphs for, but we can't really give an answer as to what they physically mean because it's more of a statistical measure than a physical one. So now for received energy. Received energy is the energy, the intensity of the laser that is beamed back to the glass instrument after it, after it has hit the earth. So you can see there's two different cases of it. The first case is, well, if the, so the, if the laser is dying, you'll see the graphs on the right. The received energy isn't that good, the graphs aren't that good. So the graphs on the left side, they have a stronger received energy, they're much stronger and the graphs are more defined. So the higher the received energy, the larger the range, the better the graph, and vice versa. And this can be shown right here. So if you look at the graph, the L1A, that's where that out. So then L2A has strong received energy. And then as it starts to die, the received energy lowers. And then it continues to the new laser with L3A. And it's a relatively, for the mean, the re received energy is relatively flat. And then as the laser starts to die, the received energy falls. So you can think of gain as the automatic volume knob of the laser, and it is determined by the previous workshops. Think of it like a TV remote at home. When the volume is too high, you turn it down. When the volume is too low, you turn it up. It's the same thing in this scenario, except with the laser intensity. If the laser is going over a cloudy area or a darker area, it will turn the intensity up so you can see it. If the signal is too high, such as over Antarctica, as you can see in the 
top left graph in the L2B, it will turn the intensity down since it easily reflects off the wider areas such as snow and Antarctica. So it doesn't need as powerful as an intensity. And this is shown right here. And another reason though intensity will raise is they, as the lasers start to die, they'll put more and more power into it. So if you look here, L2A is the basically opposite of all the graphs where before they would lower as they started to die, here they start to raise because they want to turn the, the game turns up to get the same results. So you need to turn the game up and then it dies at L2C. So then the new laser, and as the laser slowly starts to die, the game has to raise and raise to be the same as it was before. So to summarize game, um, remember uh, the way ISAT works is it fires the laser pulse and then it receives the laser pulse. But keep in mind these are billions of photons that scatter when they hit the ground, they scatter in the atmosphere, so really only a very few percent of them actually reach the instrument on its way back. So the way it was designed is the aperture of the actual receiver is only like a few millimeters thin. So um, gain was created to sort of amplify this this signal because sometimes only <coughs> barely anything gets reflected back to the, the instrument. So it's important to have both saturation correction and gain to amplify your signal. And then reflectivity is more of a calculated value. It's um, found by taking the ratio of the received energy to the transmitted energy. And um, we see that there's low reflectivity values over the oceans and really high ones at the poles. I remember oceans are really volatile, there's waves everywhere, so light tends to scatter all over the place and it almost never reaches back to the instrument in like high amounts as they would in the poles. Ice is white and high albedo goes right back, you get a really high uh, received energy pulse. So here we're able to see those. The right side, which are the L2Fs, are, um, that's the end of the lifespan of the laser. And like we've seen throughout all of these measurements, a common sort of trend in the ISAT data is that we lose significant resolution towards when we reach towards the end of the lifespan of the laser, simply because it's just the pulse aren't intense enough. We don't get those received photons. We don't get the resolution. So we have a bunch of gray spots. We have a bunch of empty spots. We can't really make reliable measurements after it's reached that point of no return. As you can see here, reflectivity, relatively constant measurement. It was pretty much uh, the same throughout all the campaigns. The very end, L2E, L2F, which was like the last laser, there's a sharp like increase, and that's just due to the, the laser pretty much dying. There's nothing. Since it's a ratio, it never really should go over one because it's received over transmitted. So the fact that it's like at two over two, this doesn't even make any physical sense. That's just to give you an idea of like how messed up the laser must be at this point. <laughs> so um, yeah. Uh, and then transmit pulse major axis. So um, when the laser is fired, it's only a few millimeters um, then, like I said, the aperture. But by the time it reaches the earth, it spans a footprint of like about 70 meters. So, um, this is a significant accuracy, and this is one of those variables that also doesn't change much throughout the campaigns since uh, the size of that footprint, the um, major axis of that ellipse, is uh, dependent on mostly just the height, so where it is in its orbit. So uh, we see the, the tracks of the satellite are highlighted in blue and dark blue, while everything else is green, which just shows like that that's the only place where we get measurements for major axis because that's was directly being measured by the satellite at that point in time. So, yet again, when we talk about tracks, uh, tracks are the little lines that the satellite happens to pass over every time it crosses the Earth, every time it orbits. So those are mostly the patterns we see with the major axis because there's not much else to see. We look at the graphs for major axis, they're also pretty much constant throughout the laser three's lifetime. Laser one was, was messed up. It, it only lasted less, less than a month. So we can totally see the decrease there and also in the beginning stages of laser two. But that middle part is the most reliable measurement because it's the one that lasts longest, lasted four years. 
So we can see there that major axis is really one of those things that varies too much, except for the end of the lifespan again for laser design and the accuracy of its precision. On the point that it lasted for laser three lasted four years, it's important to know that the three lasers for ISAT, each one was supposed to last one year when it was originally planned, designed to like actually work before the lasers did. And um, laser three is the only laser that really worked as long as it should have because each of these campaigns was one month and laser three lasted 11 campaigns, which is 11 months. And that was the only one that was really close to how it should have been. Transmit pulse intensity is our last parameter that we mapped. And really this parameter gives us an analysis of the functionality of the laser. So intensity is power over area. And basically what happens in the ISAT machine is when it sends out that beam, part of it actually collects the data and it reads the intensity. And this is measured in counts. So what the maps show is that it does in fact tell us that the laser is dying. Because if you see at the beginning of a campaign on laser two, it's very even where all the colors are green. And that shows that it is working. But by the end, everything's purple. And on the scale, purple means the intensity is reading zero. That's ba that basically means that the laser is dead. So again, on the graph, it shows us that the laser died at the end. It just goes boom. It's uh, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The satellite uses lasers as also precise orbiting tape measures, while it changes in a variety of features about the planet below. I use that to get up. I didn't know it is that. Anyway, so ISAT 2 is planned for September 2018. It will do the same studies that the original ISAT did, but the original ISAT had um, lasers being transmitted at about 40 hertz. So that's 40 laser beams, beams per second. ISAT 2 will have 10,000 hertz, and that's 10,000 laser beams per second. So we're saying 10,000 laser beams, just to put that into perspective, with the current ISAT data we have, which was 40 measurements per second, we have over 2 billion data points in the ISAT uh, server with all our data in it. So with 10,000 pulses per second, we're gonna need some pretty heavy processing power. So we see there's gonna be ground stations located in Norway and Virginia, where 220 megabit X-band download connections are gonna work to uh, move that data off the satellite because it has limited storage on, on the actual instrument itself. 220 megabit is pretty fast. I mean, most industry workplaces have gigabit, which is 1,000 megabits. So for a satellite in space to have one-fifth of the processing power of like an office is pretty impressive. <coughs> and here's some comparison between ISAT 1 and ISAT 2. Yet again, 40 pulses versus 10,000 pulses. And we're also going to get significant accuracy, more accuracy in ISAT 2, since ISAT 1, uh, each footprint that I measured, like I said, was 70 meters. And then it would measure them about every 150 to 170 meters. So there'd be pretty big gaps, like you saw in the video. ISAT 2, on the other hand, has 17 meter diameters, which is a lot less. And then the sampling interval, since it's 10,000 pulses, is less than a meter. So to put that in perspective, if you think about like, like a football field, original ISAT would make a measurement at each end zone, while ISAT 2 would get them at every yard line. So overall, the ISAT, as he said, collected over 2 billion measurements. And this is a lot, so we also needed to make a lot of maps. So what we did is we had the 10 parameters, each of them had four modes, which was mean, and max of RMS, and each of those had 18 campaigns. So this totals up to 720 maps, which we manually made. And the importance of this, I think, is just that visualizing the binary information in the form of a map, it really allows us to get a unique view of our Earth, and allows us to get a new understanding of it. So I'm going to make this uh, short and sweet because I can see a couple of you guys falling asleep in the audience. So <laughs> we'd like to thank Dr. Tim Rubin, our mentor. He's been awesome. He's 
He's totally cool. Um, Miss Bagno, she's been great. She's been keeping us on track, on time. It's been awesome. Um, I think probably my favorite experience through um, this program is um, how diverse NASA is with its research. Like when you think of NASA, you think of like the space shuttle or the International Space Station. You forget that these satellites are like orbiting the Earth right now, trying to figure out the mysteries of our home planet because we still don't know a lot about it. Yeah, I want to give a thank you to our mentor as well. Um, I came into ISAT not really sure what our project was because we didn't get too much information about it. So uh, the, when we got you know Unix shells thrown at us and like this huge database of, of measurements thrown at us, I was just like, I don't know what we're gonna do. But once we got through all those maps and started seeing like visually what all those numbers meant, it really put it into perspective what it was we were studying, what it was that ISAT did. And I thought that was really amazing. Um, our teacher externs, um, one of which isn't here right now, but uh, they, they were a great company. They helped us a lot, they, um, gave us a lot of advice. Um, Cecilia, thank you for putting up with our terrible music. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we had a great time as the exit. Yeah. yeah, one of the main things I'm taking away from this project and CIS is just the power of maps. Like visualizing <laughs> this data, we could be able to understand anything. And also, this research is so important and vital to our society. So being able to have this experience is just very important for me and my future. <laughs> <laughs> well. I think one of the biggest things for me from CES is just meeting all these cool people from all around the country who are just so different, but like so smart. And I've been able to learn so much from every single one of the student interns here. And I just really appreciated this experience. So the people before me already said thank you, but thank you again for everyone. But one of the things I took out of this the most is, you know, when you're at home, when you come home from school, you have no one to distract you. You do your homework, you do whatever else you have to do, you go to sleep. Here, it basically helps you get ready for college. You have to learn to cancel out the distractions, do your work, and then after you do your work, you know, you have time to have fun. But first you have to do your work, and that was a huge help for me to realize that, you know, after next year, I'm going to college, so just help me prepare. Um, any questions? So based on the work that you accomplished this year, what would you recommend for next year's seeds and turns to do with the to carry on your mission, your mapping mission? Um, I just want to say the first. Um, a lot of what we did was maps that we haven't really seen before and aren't really online. So it'd be cool to figure out what those maps really actually mean and being able to like interpret them and learn more about them. Yeah, in our report, we have all of our maps in there. So that'll serve as a good resource for next year's ISAT team. Hopefully they can uh, work a little to try and interpret some things that we just didn't really have I'm really going to yet again 178 variables we did 10 of them there's so much more that ISAT has to offer and I think that's really something that you'll be able to go into in depth to the future interns that will be in the next ISAT group before you come down to Austin make sure your computer can run GMT so you can actually make maps I was not able to make a single map during this project so that kind of that will that will Okay, join me in thanking the ISAT. Now, give a poster. It's getting hung up in the building, by the way. So we all want to stay up here. We're going to take some group pictures of the ones that presented this afternoon. We'll start with ISAT. Dr. Irvin, come on down. <laughs> Oh my God, that's my friend. That's my friend. Andrew. 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 Andrew.